Welcome back to the Algarve. So I've owned my Triumph Trident for nearly three months now and I thought like a good YouTuber I'd run through the top things I like and dislike about the bike. I'm not sure if there'll be exactly seven on each side but we won't be far off. So let's start with the things that maybe Triumph could improve on a Mark II or a Trident RS. I should point out that none of these faults is a deal breaker for me. Overall I'm happy with my choice, choice of bike uh, this year. Um, so in no particular order, uh, number one on my list of pet hates for want of a better expression, um, the brakes. The brakes are okay, they do the job, the bike stops well enough and the brakes are absolutely not substandard. But compared to the Brembo M50s I had on my Street Triple and the Stylemas I've tried on a couple of other bikes like the Rocket and the Tiger 900 and the Ducati Street Fighter, the Trident's Nissin setup is a bit ordinary. Brakes often get overlooked in favour of engine power, but I for one really appreciate having unburstable stopping power, even when I'm applying gentle force and almost coasting to a standstill. Number two on my list of pet hates would be the storage space, or lack thereof. There's just about room under the seat for a miniature multi-tool, but that's it. You won't get a disc lock in there, and even the factory USB charger is a bit of a squeeze. And being a naked, there's also very little space to conceal any accessories, wires, or whatever, and I still haven't found a space to conceal the admittedly large Denali sound bomb horn. Number three, the firm ride. Now, despite being sold as a gentler, more beginner-friendly version of the Street Triple, the suspension, particularly at the rear, is just as firm as it was on my 2017 RS. And if the road surface is poor, then it quickly becomes an uncomfortable experience. And while the seat is a good shape, there isn't a lot of padding. There is preload adjustment, of course, on the rear shock, but it comes out of the factory already on its most compliant setting, so there's little recourse there either. Aftermarket uh, rear shocks are beginning to appear, YSS have one out, but I fear they may have rushed to market a little too eagerly because owners who have taken the plunge are reporting that the only way to adjust the shock is to remove it completely from the bike. I'm going to wait, but I may well treat myself to some Swedish gold, depending on price, of course. Oh, well, there are a few signs of cost cutting here and there. The rear brake pedal looks a bit AliExpress, and the clutch and front uh, brake levers are non adjustable and too great a stretch for me, despite my having large hands. I swapped them out for some aftermarket levers from Tech Parts in the UK. Uh, which are fully adjustable and nicer to use and they're also black which I think is more in keeping with the look of the bike's front end. Details can be found in my Mods and Tweaks Part 2 video, a link to which I shall put in the description and somewhere up in the corner of the screen just about now. Number five, a few dubious aesthetic choices. I went with the silver for the gorgeous paint on the tank, but there are too many red highlights in, in my book. The undertail red plastic bit is okay, but the radiator cowls are a bit too much, especially as presumably for cost reasons. Triumph have used a radiator that's too wide for the bike. It protrudes unnecessarily, and slapping some bright red covers on just exacerbates the problem. I have some silver cowls on order, but they're taking forever to arrive. The less said about the red flash on the mudguard, the better. Uh, and in fact, covering, covering it with some matte black vinyl was one of the very first mods I did. The giant Triumph logo looks very nice from a distance, in my opinion, but the vinyl they've used is inexplicably thick. Uh, so the lettering protrudes a lot more than paint would, although I understand that painting would be very expensive. It's only a detail, but a shame nonetheless. Number six, engine power. Is 80 horsepower enough? Yes, of course, I, I don't need any more power, but I would like maybe just a smidge more. 
I've ridden a whole range of bikes from my wife's 9 horsepower Honda scooter to the crazy 208 horsepower Ducati Street Fighter. But most of the bikes I've actually owned have all been in the 80 to 110, 120 horsepower range. And I have to say that at least for my riding style and limited skills, 100 horsepower seems to be the sweet spot. That said, the 105 horsepower BMW F900 XR I had last year didn't feel that much more eager than the Trident, probably because it needed revving to access the power. And this brings us nicely on to the Trident's good points, again, in no particular order. Starting with the triple engine, which actually probably is one of the bike's most redeeming features. Yes, it's only got 80 horsepower, but it's a real peach. Sounds fabulous and has plenty of low down torque, meaning that riding to or around town is a real pleasure. It does begin to run out of breath above about 6,500 revs, and that's when you can tell that you've only got 80 horsepower between your legs. But you'll already be at illegal speeds anyway, so being kept in check by the relative lack of power actually makes for a more enjoyable experience. I realised a long time ago that the best fun on two wheels, at least on the road, is to be had not necessarily by riding fast, but by riding flat out. I like our weedy little 9 horsepower scooter precisely because I can whiz around town almost permanently on full throttle. Is it any good on a dual carriageway? Absolutely not just as the Trident wouldn't be my go-to bike for a track day. But in normal day-to-day -day riding, and with its low-down torque, the Trident is a really nice bike to live with. I got rid of my 120 horsepower Street Triple precisely because I was tired of going everywhere at 100 miles an hour. The Trident can be ridden enthusiastically, but it's not constantly urging you on to crazy legal speeds. The Trident is more sensible than the MT-07, but less, dare I say, boring than the CB650R, and it definitely suits me. Number two, the way it looks. For an entry-level naked, the Trident has got a refreshingly modern look to it. You feel good when you see it in your garage. There aren't a huge number of directions you can take when you've only got an engine, two wheels and some handlebars to play with. So despite the odd parts I've already alluded to, like the levers where Triumph have been forced to cheap out a little to remain competitive on price, I think they've done a good job. I'm not completely sold on the swing arm mounted number plate holder, but at the same time, I'm loath to ruin the pert rear end by slapping a tail tidy on it and removing some of the bike's essence. EvoTech have just announced a tail tidy, but apart from the very considerable price tag, I'm not sure about having to swap out the stock rear light for EvoTech's proprietary clear lens. Aftermarket clear lights can look a bit dodgy, but let's wait and see what the finished product looks like on the bike. Number three on my list of things that I love about the Triumph Trident would be the general fit and finish. Again, leaving to one side the two or three parts that could perhaps have benefited from a couple of extra quid being spent on them, the overall finish on the Trident is at least as good, if not better, than on my considerably more expensive Street Triple. The paint on the tank is deep and lustrous and really pops in the sun. The plastics used are all good quality and the switch gear is logically laid out, except for the horn button, which is too small and difficult to press in an emergency. Number four, the exhaust note. Unsurprisingly, the Trident gets the same inimitable whoosh characteristic of the company's three-cylinder engine. But what did surprise me was just how close to the street triple the Trident sounds. In all honesty, in a blind test, I would have sworn the Trident was a street triple. It's that good. Number five, the tyres. Now I criticised Triumph earlier on for penny pinching on a few parts, 
but they certainly haven't scrimped on the tyres. Very nice Michelin Road 5s that suit the bike's temperament perfectly. So well done on that score triumph. Number six would be this clock that you've been staring at for the past five minutes. Quite simply, one of the best I've seen on any bike, to be honest. Everyone praises the BMW TFT screen, but I had that on my F900XR last year, and while it does look very appealing in a showroom, to be honest, I prefer the simplicity of the Trident's hybrid setup with its backlit LCD on the top and small TFT on the bottom. When I'm riding, I only really look at speed, revs and fuel anyway, so trying to feed me any more information than that, like maximum lean angle or g-force when I brake, is a bit of a waste. The only weak spot is the Bluetooth module, which is a bit temperamental. It took me several attempts to get the sat-nav to pair properly with my iPhone X, and the directions are a bit rudimentary compared to proper map-based guidance. But it's certainly better than nothing and I don't regret paying the extra for it. Number seven would be the riding position. Now this will depend of course on individual morphology and riding preferences but for me at six foot two or 197 centimeters and with what I would best describe as a semi sporty riding style it's pretty much spot on. Less sporty than my street triple but also less sit up and beg than the adventure type bikes I owned previously. And finally, number eight, you see there were more positives than negatives. Um, what for me is the Trident's outstanding feature, its price. And one of the reasons I didn't gel with my all singing, all dancing BMW last year was that in the back of my mind, I could hear a little voice reminding me that I'd spent the best part of 15,000 euros on a bike that I really wasn't getting that much pleasure from. Expectations had been high and so the subsequent disappointment was also considerable. The Trident is pretty much half the price but it's much more fun to ride and that nagging doubt about having so much money tied up in what for me is basically a toy uh, just isn't there. Some journalists have gone as far as to say that the Trident is the best bike in Triumph's lineup, which is quite a bold statement, but I know exactly what they mean. I rode the Rocket again recently, video link in the description if you're interested, and reached the same conclusion. It's three times the price of the Trident, but no way is it three times as good. Of course I'm aware that as with cars there's an exponential increase in price as you increase performance and features, and of course if I could afford to keep 10 bikes in my garage, I would definitely like a rocket, but if you're after an affordable do-it-all bike, then you can't go far wrong with the Trident. So what would I do if I had a magic wand? Well, I maybe would add a few more colour options and another 15-20 horsepower, but then of course we'd need better brakes and better suspension, which would push the price beyond what I would feel comfortable messing around on. As it stands, I think Triumph have pulled off a masterstroke. As always, thanks for watching.